Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us from all around the world. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, to this very exciting uh, webinar, uh, where we'll, we'll be discussing how to address eating hunger through agriculture, and then progress with biotification in West Africa. My name is Babatunde Omilola, and I work for the African Development Bank, leading the division responsible for public health, nutrition, and social protection of the African Development Bank. I'm delighted to welcome all of you. Today, we have many distinguished uh, participants, panelists that we'll learn from. But before we begin, let me give us some housekeeping rules very quickly. Uh, in terms of how today is going to go, we have our panelists that will talk to us about many issues regarding the today's topic. But all questions will be answered during the question and answer session at the end of the panel conversation. Please keep your cameras and microphones off while we are presenting and during the panel discussions. Please also use the question and answer functions at the bottom of your Zoom screen to input your questions please refrain from using the chat box as much as possible. Uh, at the same time, um, we have interpretation for today's uh, webinar. Uh, you will find the uh, interpretation link uh, somewhere um, at the bottom of the um, Zoom link. Kindly use it for English or French. Asking our interpreters to ensure that uh, you know, so, so that you know, only the presenter also to present in a way that people can really follow and uh, participate in today's webinar. Uh, having said that, let me now uh, introduce our first speaker today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Martin Fregene, uh, who is the Director of Agriculture and Agro Industry Department of the African Development Bank. Uh, for Dr. Fregene, we are giving you uh, basically uh, five minutes to make your intervention uh, in terms of how the multisectoral action plan of the African Development Bank can be very useful uh, for us to achieve our about fortification, uh, especially in West Africa. Uh, so when it is one minute before your time is up, I will let you know. Uh, Dr. Martin Fregene, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Baba Sunde. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. It's good to see a um, very important guest like um, Dr. Howard um, um, Debus with us also, and many other distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to join you all to um, address this very important gathering. Um, Biofortification and um, but in general is very close and very dear to my heart. My career before joining the bank at the Donald Danford Plant Science Center was managing a project to actually biofortify cassava with, um, with um, um, pro-vitamin A, um, things like um, you know, iron and also with zinc. It's a great pleasure to address you know, this distinguished um, gathering upon addressing hunger through agriculture and progress about fortification in West Africa. This meeting is co-organized by the ALN, the African Leadership for Nutrition, and our champion, Howard Buiz, and, and also Harvest Plus. This is exactly the type of high-level multipartite <coughs> cooperation that the ALDB had in mind when we created and the ALN. We really want and the ALN you know, to have very credible voices like um, Howard and also like them, Harvest Plus, you know, champion the advocacy for nutrition on the continent. 
We also appreciate that this is part of the African Union's Commission initiative through its various regional economic commissions to um, mainstream and also to actually, you know, um, ensure full participation in this in, in, in the in, in the events leading up to the African um, Year of Nutrition 2022. It is no news that uh, malnutrition is a huge body to children in Africa. 61.4 million children under five are either stunted, you know, and that's um, their highest compared to their ages is, 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 you know, is, 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 you know, is much reduced, and 12.1 million are wasted. And another 10.6 million, unbelievably, are also overweight, they're, they're obese. COVID-19 has just worsened, you know, the, the, the malnutrition picture in Africa. Also, the, the lack of diversity in our, in, 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 in our food basket of the continent and lack of strong nutrients, you know, is, there are, are strong drivers of, of poor food um, availability and also uh, poor food choices for people of, of West Africa in particular, and also East Africa. Advocating for governments to increase investments in a, in, a, in a nutrition and food systems is the way to go. That is why this meeting, series of meetings leading up to the AU 2022 year of nutrition are very, very important. The African Development Bank through the leader, through, through ALN is spearheading high level political engagement to advocate for urgent intervention. ALN is also engaging political leadership at, at the very highest you know, levels to increase resources dedicated to improving nutritional outcomes, of which Africa already has some very good examples. We have seen what has happened in, in Ethiopia, we see also what's happened in you know, Senegal, where political will and clear policies can actually lead to um, improvements. The ALN is promoting a dialogue with heads of states, ministers of finance, as, as nutrition champions to accelerate progress towards achieving the continental and global nutrition targets set out in the World Health Assembly's plan for maternal, infant, and young children and nutrition. It is in this vein that this meeting is being held to examine the progress made in West Africa and also to address hidden hunger through biofortification. Biofortification, as Harvest Plus has demonstrated, is a potent solution to tackle micronutrient deficiency in developing countries where a large population cannot afford fruits, vegetables, legumes, fish, and other food products to meet their essential nutritional requirements. I'm proud to say that I was part of the original team back in SEAT. This was like in 19, 1995, something like that, when the discussion on biofortification first started. And I continue working on this even at the, Dan at the Danforth Center you know, in St. Louis. The African Development Bank crew is Technologies for African Agricultural Trans Transformation, or TAT, has also been spearheading the scaling up of um, nutritious you know, foods. For example, the orange flesh sweet potato, high iron beans, and soon um, high zinc rice, and also small livestock and aquaculture. TAT, like you know, has reached more than 10 million people and have actually, you know, it, which includes reaching them with um, orange flesh sweet potatoes, high iron bean, you know, and, um, and small livestock and aquaculture. The bank's nutrition programs aims to catalyze innovative private sector investment also to increase availability and accessibility of nutritious and healthy foods. The bank is very keen to play a role in reducing stunting by 2025. Before I stop, I just want to mention a few of the bank's projects. Some of them you already know, but just to buttress the fact that the bank actually plays a lot of um, importance on, on nutrition and reducing stunting. The first one is in Ethiopia, a multi-sectoral approach to re reducing stunting that was approved in April 2021. The project aims to train and provide 100% of irrigation water to user groups to, to enable them grow you know, um, high nutrients in you know, crops like high iron beans, cow peas, mung beans, and um, quality, high quality protein maize, you know, pigeon peas, camelina, amaranth, quinoa, and other um, vegetables and legumes. This will help promote you know, um, malnutrition foods among the population. The second project is the agro-industrial project in the Belia region of Northern Ivory Coast. Here, we are promoting biofortification through, through the support of um, local agricultural groups and also international 
organizations are already intervening in this region to support the improved health outcomes of the, of the population. And lastly, our multinational national rice distribution project that, that covered what, seven countries in West Africa, where we are actually pushing you know, rice, but now we're going to start pushing high zinc rice in the same regions. Finally, and let me take this opportunity to reiterate that the three regional webinars being organized by Harvest Plus and um, ALN in collaboration with the regional economic communities is a very important one for us, a very important dialogue leading up, leading up to the AU summit next year that has nutrition as a, as a theme for the year. I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very fruitful meeting. Thank you so much and then back to you, Baba Tunde. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin Fregene, especially for taking us through how uh, the whole concept of biofortification started and also what the African Development Bank is doing in this space. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Now, as we move on, uh, on the, in the agenda, we want to basically test your knowledge of what you understand by biofortification and whether you know what is going on uh, in West Africa when it comes to biofortification. So we are going to ask uh, two questions generally um, so that uh, we get a sense of whether uh, the uh, participants today are really well aware of what multiplication is all about. So the first question is going to be uh, to test your understanding of biofortification. What do you understand by biofortification? You will have an uh, opportunity to basically answer this particular question. Uh, we are giving you three options. Um, the first option is uh, whether biofortification is an industrial fortification technology or whether it is a technology that enriches crops with essential micronutrients or whether it is the study of crops in an environment. So uh, the but please vote refer, is open. Refer to, the, uh, refer to the link in your in the chat box to find the Mentimeter link so you have access to these questions. Thank you, Baba Tunde. Thank you, Masu. I think it's safe to say that we have a lot of biofortification experts here because everyone is actually picking the correct response. <laughs> it might have been from uh, Dr. Martin's uh, great opening remarks, but I think we can say that we have a good group here that understands uh, what biofortification is. So what I'll do is I'll move on to the next question. Um, so how many countries in West Africa have released biofortification, uh, biofortified uh, crop varieties for use by farmers? So please, we'll give you uh, 30 seconds to respond. Um, thank you. Okay, so yes, the correct response is seven. So once again, I think we can say this is a quite a well uh, knowledgeable group. Um, our presentations by uh, Dr. Howarth uh, slash Howdy and Dr. Youssef um, from Harvest Plus will also expand on both of these questions. Um, so I'll go Thank ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saga, for that. Um, we have a uh, knowledgeable group here on what uh, bulk fortification means. So now um, I, I, I'm going to invite Dr. Howdy uh, to basically make a keynote presentation. Uh, but as a way of introduction, Dr. Howdy Boz is an ALN champion, champion of the African Leaders for Nutrition, uh, is also the founding CEO of Harvest Plus. And he was um, awarded the 2016 World Food Prize Laureate. Uh, so he so, um, is an eminent speaker uh, on this particular topic, and he has been one of the pioneers 
uh, on biofortification around the world. For Dr. Audi, uh, we are going to give you 13 minutes for your keynote presentation. And we will want you to cover two key questions for our participants. Uh, the first question is, how do stables form the foundation of food systems? And therefore, why is biofortification taking center stage on enriching crops? The second question is around why is fortification considered a scalable and sustainable approach in addressing micronutrient deficiencies? Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to cover these two main questions in your keynote presentation. 13 minutes for you, Dr. Audi. You have the floor, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Martin, thank you for your opening remarks. Uh, a lot of fun memories working with you at CIAD later at the Danforth Center and now at the African Development Bank. Um, thanks for the opportunity to the organizers to speak today about linking agriculture and nutrition, an overview of biofortification and Harvest Plus. I'm addressing you from our home in Los Banos, Philippines, where my wife and I have retired in my wife's hometown. Uh, Los Banos is the home of the University of the Philippines Premier Agricultural University and the headquarters of the International Rice Research Institute. Go to the next slide. So there's no one strategy that will solve the problem of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. A mix of strategies is required. Each has its own particular comparative advantages and drawbacks. Some can be implemented relatively quickly, which relieves current untold suffering but these tend to be more expensive. Are governments willing to maintain recurrence expenditures year after year for these shorter term strategies? Agricultural strategies are lower cost, but take longer to implement. A theme that I will return to later is whether policymakers have the patience and perseverance to pursue longer term strategies that avoid the same recurrent costs year after year and are more resilient and sustainable. The next slide. When the issue of mineral and vitamin deficiencies was first recognized, the nutrition community began with programs to provide supplements and food fortification, which filled the gaps, but did not directly treat the underlying problem of poor quality diets. For example, 10 billion vitamin A supplements have been given out over the past 20 years to preschool children, saving millions of lives. The cost is one to $2 per supplement. Countries must continue to spend year after year for supplements and food fortification. Next slide, please. So this simple stylistic diagram makes the point that it is much more cost-effective and sustainable for agriculture to supply a higher percentage of minerals and vitamins that people need at affordable prices, as represented by the green shaded portion of the rectangle, which represents total mineral and vitamin requirements. Initially, the nutrition community was focused on filling the, filling the yellow gap in the diagram, not growing the green supply of nutrients from agriculture. Next slide. As we look to the future, we can break down the specific activities to be undertaken within agriculture into two broad groups. First, those activities which focus on food staples, which must increase the density of minerals and vitamins. Consumers already eat maximum amounts of food staples. Second, those activities which focus on non-staple foods must seek to increase the quantities eaten. Fundamentally, the second strategy is only possible if incomes can be increased and food prices can be lowered. Both broad strategies need to be pursued simultaneously. Next slide, please. Food staples are not dense in minerals and vitamins. However, the absolute intake of minerals and vitamins from food staples is the result of multiplying quantities consumed times the density. The first term in this multiplication, quantities consumed of food staples, is a high number. Thus, as this slide shows, 
milled rice in the Philippines provides a very significant proportion of a wide range of minerals and vitamins in the diet. In fact, no single food in the Philippines provides more nutrients than rice. The objective then within the sub-strategy of focusing on food staples is to increase densities. Next slide, please. I myself have worked for more than 25 years to promote and implement a strategy of biofortification through plant breeding. This picture shows a deep orange maize developed through conventional plant breeding, which is high in vitamin A. Africans eat white maize, which has no vitamin A, but, but vitamin A deficiency is widespread. The orange mazes are high yielding and sell for the same price as white maize, getting Africans to substitute orange maize for white maize in their diets will go a long way toward eliminating vitamin A deficiency at no extra cost to consumers. Next slide. Several types of biofortified crops are now released in 40 countries and are in testing for release in more than 20 additional countries. Some crops have more iron, some crops have more zinc, some have more vitamin A. Next slide. This map simply shows the 63 countries where releases already have been approved or are in testing for release. Biofortification is truly a global activity. Next slide, please. You cannot read the detail in this chart, which is available on the Harvest Plus website, and which shows which crops are released or are in testing in all 63 countries. The statistics include orange sweet potato varieties developed and disseminated through the International Potato Center, which is not a part of Harvest Plus. In his presentation, Yusuf Dola of Harvest Plus Nigeria will provide specific information on biofortified crop varieties available in West Africa. Next slide, please. This is an older map which tries to convey all of the previous detail in one slide. Nearly 400 biofortified crop varieties have been released in low and middle income countries. Biofortified crops are being grown by a minimum estimate of 10 million farm households globally. Harvest Plus is now striving to make the numbers of producers and consumers of biofortified crops much higher in the hundreds of millions. Next slide. It is important to note that there is a wealth of evidence now in the nutrition literature that increasing the density of vitamin A, iron, and zinc in food staples improves micronutrient status and demonstrates even that functional outcomes are improved, such as less sickness and better cognitive and work performance. Others will present later in the program on delivery strategies to scale up uptake of biofortified crops by farmers and consumers. Next slide. I turn now to vegetables, fruits, pulses, animal products those foods which are, are already dense in minerals and vitamins. In my opinion, the fundamental strategy should be to increase the supply of specific key foods that contribute importantly to nutrient intakes, where supply can be increased cost effectively through public policy and investments. There are two fundamental points to make here. First, the primary objective is to lower the price of these specific foods. Second, these specific foods will vary greatly by country depending on dietary patterns. Next slide, please. I find quote unquote food systems to be a very broad and complex concept that can be paralyzing in terms of determining specific actionable interventions. My advice is to start with the specific foods that can make a difference, then do what is necessary within particular food systems 
to relieve constraints to expanding supply and lowering the price. A perfect example is provided by the work of 2019 World Food Prize laureate Simon Group. For decades, his East West Seed Company has been expanding, developing, and disseminating hybrid vegetable seeds in Africa and Asia. Farmer productivity has increased while more rapidly growing supplies allow for the possibility of falling prices for vegetables. Next slide, please. Let me make a few final comments on the resolve or lack thereof of agricultural policymakers to work within the nutrition community on reducing malnutrition and improving health. First, let me make the quick point that focusing on food staples offers advantages under the COVID pandemic. Dietary quality is worsening as incomes fall. There is continued high levels of consumption of food staples and a government focus on ensuring food staple supplies. Food staple approaches to increasing density offer extra minerals and vitamins in diets at no extra cost to consumers. Apart from short run concerns about COVID, to address malnutrition, we need a mix of all approaches, short run nutrition direct, such as supplementation and commercial fortification, and long run nutrition smart interventions that treat the underlying causes and make the foundation of food systems more nutritious. It is a matter of finding leaders and champions for each individual approach and persevering. We need to bring in more funding under the overall nutrition umbrella. Next slide, please. Although they are cost efficient, sustainable and resilient, a drawback to agricultural approaches are the long gestation periods. It takes many years, often decades, to have large scale impacts globally. As parents, we invest in our children's education over 20 years. Can policymakers and donors take the same long-term perspective with agriculture? The long-term payoffs are very high. Agricultural policymakers are accustomed to focusing on agricultural productivity and rural incomes and reducing poverty. Asking them also to give priority to a nutrition lens is a relatively new idea. Some progress has been made which might be discussed in the question and answer period. It is important to have positive examples to show which can incentivize further momentum. Next slide, please. On one of my visits to FAO headquarters in Rome, I was waiting to meet someone in the main lobby. I noticed a small plaque on the wall and went over to read it. This is what it said. In this building, 16th of October, 1945, representatives of 44 nations met and established the Food and Agricultural Organization, first of the new United Nations agencies. Thus, for the first time, nations organized to raise levels of nutrition and to improve production and distribution of food and agricultural products. I thought, wow. 75 years ago, the policymakers mentioned nutrition first and agricultural supply second. What has happened in the meantime? Next slide. So in closing, let me read this quote. Such intimately related subjects as agriculture, food, nutrition, and health have become split up into innumerable rigid and self-contained little units, each in the hands of some group of specialists. The experts soon find themselves learning more and more about less and less. The remedy is to look at the whole field covered by crop production, animal husbandry, food, nutrition, and health as one related subject and to realize that the birthright of every crop, every animal, and every human being is health. Next slide. This quote sounds very contemporary but it was written again in 1945. These ideas and concepts, broadly speaking, have been around for a long time, but it takes leadership and perseverance to put them into practice. So next slide. 
Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the discussion to follow. Those of you who can get hold of a copy of the slide deck, uh, there's some references to, uh, to look up related to some of the topics that I've been talking about. Thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Howdy, for that excellent uh, keynote presentation. Thank you for taking us on the memory lane in terms of how FAO was uh, uh, created, uh, especially uh, to raise the levels for nutrition around the world. And I think that's why we are all here today. And just to mention that at the African Development Bank, uh, in addition to the ALN, we have what you call the Banking on Nutrition Partnership, uh, which is a partnership that uh, involves the uh, Aliko Dangote Foundation and the Big Win Philanthropy, through which we have been able to scale up about $2.3 billion uh, nutrition smart investments across the continent. Uh, so um, it resonates very well the idea that we have to invest more in nutrition. And um, for us at the African Development Bank, we continue to do more on this. Uh, thank you so much for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, now, let me introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Anes Obi. Uh, Mr. Anes Obi is the head of agriculture division uh, for the ECOWAS, Economic Community of West African States uh, Commission. Uh, he will talk to us uh, very briefly, three minutes on behalf of ECOWAS, uh, just to let us know what is going on uh, in West Africa in terms of bulk fortification and what ECOWAS is doing uh, in that space. Uh, do we now have uh, Mr. Hannes Obi online? Uh, can he please uh, take the floor? Hannes Obi, are you there? Uh, it seems he is not yet online, uh, so I think we will uh, ask him to make his intervention later. Uh, for now, we have uh, six eminent speakers that would like to take the floor. Uh, the first of them is uh, Mr. Yusuf Dollar. Mr. Yusuf Dollar is from the Aves Plus Nigeria and is a meat specialist. Um, the key question that we want Mr. Yusuf Dollar to address is this. What progress has taken place in the production and consumption of our fortified crops in West Africa? And how has this progress propelled your work in Nigeria? Um, you have uh, 10 minutes for your intervention, uh, Mr. Yusuf Dola. Uh, you can take the floor, please. Uh, greetings from Nigeria. My name is Yusuf. I work for Best Plus Nigeria. Now, as a West African, um, when we eat, our uh, common staples, such as um, tuo, fufugari, or kenke, and fill our stomachs. We stretch our arms and say, yeah, we are satisfied, not minding um, whether the food we've eaten contains the um, essential micronutrients and vitamins that our body requires. And this has been a way of life here. Now, um, Again, this way of life has also caused a lot of damages to our lives as um, West Africans. Um, again, little did we know that um, when we eat these foods um, that are deficient in micronutrients and vitamins, we come up with uh, hidden hunger, um, which means um, you are eating food quite all right, but your body organs and cells are not getting the required um, uh, vitamins and uh, micronutrients. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, if you look at this map, you see where uh, West Africa is placed and the colors allotted to us, which means um, in West Africa, the case is severe and also alarming. So that means the problem lives with us. Next slide, please. Now, again, um, this, uh, this graph um, is also showing us that about um, half of women of reproductive age in West Africa are anemic, you know, and uh, since the year 2000, um, the situation had only improved uh, marginally. And the leading cause of anemia is uh, um, iron deficiency. Next slide. 
Now, this slide also shows us that, yeah, about 28% of um, children under the age of uh, five are also affected by stunting in uh, West Africa. And since um, year 2000, um, the situation has only improved uh, modestly. Next slide. Now, to solve these problems, um, Harvest Plus um, uh, in West Africa um, is promoting um, uh, the iron pearl millet, um, which provides up to 80% of uh, daily iron needs. Uh, also, we have the uh, orange sweet potato, which provides up to 100% of uh, daily vitamin A needs. Um, the vitamin A cassava, which provides up to 100% of uh, daily vitamin A needs. Uh, then the vitamin A maize, which provides 50% of uh, daily vitamin A needs. And uh, work is ongoing on uh, zinc rice and as well as uh, um, zinc maize. Next. Yeah, um, how they had shown uh, this chart, and I'm also showing it here for us to see uh, the crops that have been released um, in West Africa, and as well as uh, those undergoing testing. Now, in addition to the crops I mentioned initially, we have in addition uh, the vitamin A, banana, and plantain. We have uh, the zinc and iron sorghum. Um, and also the iron and zinc cowpea, which are undergoing testing um, in West Africa. Next slide. Iron pearl millet developed for uh, the harid regions, Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali, Northern Nigeria, Northern Ghana, or Senegal. And um, ECOWAS had already allowed this variety to be cultivated in any of the member country without further uh, seeking for uh, approval. Next slide. Now, uh, coming to Nigeria, um, our intervention strategy has been the value chain approach. Um, we work closely with the National Research Institutes uh, for them to um, develop um, high yielding biofortified crops, because uh, that is one of those things farmers look at before accepting uh, technologies like this. They look at uh, how competitive the crop is. So um, all the biofortified crops we have, they are competitive, they are high yielding. We also work with the seed companies for them to be able to have access to early generation seeds from um, the research institutes for them to multiply and uh, distribute to the local agro dealer and the farmer is able to have access to certify seed from the local agro dealer shop in the community. He produces the grains or the produce. Then we also uh, work closely with uh, bulking agents and aggregators who uptake uh, this produce from uh, the farmers. They clean, they sort, they grade so that processors can also have access to quality um, raw materials. Now, um, we also work with um, government agencies, parastatals, NGOs, financial institutions now, and for them to, um, and all other those that add uh, value to the value chain, uh, also enhance the performance of the value chain. Um, the government is also um, in this. We work closely um, with the state and federal government for the creation of enabling environment for the value chains at both state and federal levels. Um, next slide, please. Continuously, we keep integrating SMEs into the value chain because we want the value chain to keep working. And I'll be telling you that, yeah, uh, there have never been any dull moments um, with the value chains but the challenge has only been the security challenge. Uh, but over the years, we've also um, come up with strategies to enable us implement our value chains in crisis area. So we've moved on. Next slide. Yeah, we um, work with large scale uh, processors, uh, those that um, buy um, large volumes of um, uh, raw materials um, from the biofortified crops 
and process into products. So uh, when they buy, they create markets for um, the smallholder farmers. And when the smallholder farmers are able to sell their produce, they become happy and they get encouraged to do more. Yeah, next slide. Um, we uh, work with champions, at bo uh, both politicians and also government officials. We work closely with them um, in advocacies and also uh, for the creation of enabling environment for the entire biofortified crops value chain in, in, in Nigeria. So um, this is what we do in West Africa and Nigeria. Next slide. Uh, thank you for listening, please. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yusuf Dola. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Rose Omari, Senior Research Scientist, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Uh, five minutes, uh, Dr. Rose Omari. You can have the floor, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this uh, webinar. So I'll talk, uh, my presentation will focus on why we in CSIR have embraced biofortification and have been conducting research in that area. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just by way of introduction. Nutritional status in Ghana, I'll talk about some strategies we've been implementing to address uh, micronutrient deficiency. Then I'll focus on some biofortification intervention, and then some of the challenges we are experiencing in Ghana in scaling up, then I'll conclude. Next slide. Yes, so Ghana has made good progress, I may say, in terms of reducing malnutrition. So you can see that from 2003, we've been able to reduce stunting from 30% to 19%. And we are hoping to achieve the Malabo target of 10% by 2025. So we have just four years to go and we still have a lot of work to do. The same with underway. We have also reduced it up to 11% and hoping to get to 5%, which is the Malabo target. Next slide. In terms of micronutrients, a recent study has shown that vitamin A deficiency is now 20% among children, and it's rarely present in women. So we've been able to really reduce micronutrient deficiency among women. And when it comes to iron and zinc, we still have a challenge because we still have uh, some deficiencies that are significant. And it is known that Iron deficiency is responsible for over 50% of anemia. And now in Ghana, we've also made some progress by reducing anemia from 76% in 2003 to 35% in 2017 among women. So for women and children, we have made some progress. But for pregnant women, we are still at 45%, which is above you know, the WHO threshold. So we still have a public health concern when it comes to anemia in pregnant women. Next slide, please. So how did we achieve this uh, progress in reducing malnutrition? We've implemented a number of interventions. Food fortification is one of them. We passed an airline in 2008 to mandatorily fortify vegetable oils with vitamin A and then wheat flour with iron, folic, and B vitamins. But recent studies have shown that for oils, 56% of them uh, are fortified on the market. But when it comes to wheat flour, only 2%. And it is because the wheat flour millet have issues because it affects the sensory properties or flavor of the wheat flour. So they are not fortifying the wheat flour. Then we also do supplementation, which is ongoing. We have vitamin A. We, have, we now have a, the gift program where iron folate tablets are given to adolescents in school and also those who are out of school. But the coverage of this is very low and it's also 
at a high cost. There are also other public health interventions like the wearing, malaria treatment, etc. And we also have the dietary diversification. But the challenge we have is that some of the foods, vegetables, are uh, very expensive. Some too are in limited uh, supply. And then we also have very low micronutrients of some of our staples. So then it came to a point we needed to consider other options. And biofortification was that option to be considered because we have seen evidence, nutrition evidence from other parts of the world, as uh, we have seen in the earlier presentation. Next slide. Yeah. So then they, there came a program called the Reaching Agents of Change, under which the orange flesh sweet potato was introduced to Ghana and promoted under that uh, project. But or, uh, potato in general has limited food, food uses in Ghana. So we needed to promote the OFSC, one to diversify the various food uses and also to introduce a number of processed and more shelf stable products. So a number of research, extensive research and product development went on and we got some support, especially from the jump starting OFSC project. So under that project, we produce a number of uh, products and recipes. And we also produce a training of trainers model so that we can use it to train people on utilization and processing of orange flesh sweet potato. And we developed several products, including complementary foods. And analysis of all these products showed that they are nutritionally adequate or enriched and can really contribute to reducing macronutrient deficiency. Currently, One more minute, Dr. Rosa Mari. One more minute, please. Can you kindly sum up? Thank you. Thank you. So a new project has now started, which will be funded by AGRA. And we hope that we will get some uh, more awareness creation on OFSC. Now, because iron is still, uh, iron deficiency is still very high, we want to see more biofortified crops like Batani A, cassava, iron, beans, and we want cowpea because cowpea is largely consumed here in Ghana. So, next slide. Yeah, so there are some challenges, public perception that all biofortified crops are GM crops. Then the inability of consumers to differentiate between biofortified maize and the yellow corn. Then there are concerns about the nutrient loss during post-harvest handling. There is low awareness generally and the short uh, uh, shelf life of OFSC. So we also don't have testing facilities to test the micronutrient content of the crop. Next slide. So I'll conclude by saying that we in Ghana, we support the holistic approach that uh, Harvest Plus has been promoting. And this can happen when we have supportive policies, legislations, and investment plans. And also when we are able to address post-service management, food safety, and then policy management. So with all this, together with nutrition education, we'll be able to address macronutrient deficiency. Next slide. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosa Murray, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we move now to our next uh, speaker. Uh, we're going to have remarks uh, from Senator Muhammad uh, Bima Enagi, uh, who is the Vice Chairman of the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and a bowel fortification champion. Uh, Honorable Senator, five minutes for you. Do we have uh, Senator Bima online? Senator Mohamed Bima Enagi of Nigeria. I saw him at the beginning, actually. He was, he was online at the very beginning. Yeah, I think he's back. Uh, he's, he's muted. He's muted. Senator Mohamed Bima Enagi, can you unmute? Okay. You have the floor, Honorable Senator. Five minutes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Obatundi Olumide. 
Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Harvest Plus for this opportunity to be part of this uh, group today. And uh, I believe uh, the two questions are quite beautiful. They are beautiful questions. What compelled me uh, to support bio, bio fortification and what promise does a uh, bio, bio fortification has in Nigeria? For the first part of the question, I would like to say that as leaders, we have a great responsibility. The responsibility is to our people, the welfare of our people, the health of our people, the security of our people. We are aware that part of the requirements for everybody is micronutrients. They are necessary for growth. They are necessary for good health. They are necessity, I mean, they are very necessary to avoid diseases. And because of that, we have a duty to our people to see how we can support the biofortification in this country. Most of the stable foods that our people take lack most of the macronutrients, like rice, like cassava, like beans. They lack adequate proportion of zinc, of iron, of vitamin A, and therefore we find it very important that whatever we need to do to support biofortification in this country is necessary. I was glad to meet Harvest Plus about two years ago, and since then I've been supporting Harvest Plus. I know fully well that due to lack of, bio of uh, uh, adequate nutrients in our food, it's affecting the health of our people, especially children and women. Children below the age of two, a large proportion of them, they experience a lot of malnutrition. Our women of childbearing age, they also experience the effects of malnutrition. Some of these include wasting, starting, risk to our women during childbirth. And because of that, especially in the northern part of the country where I come from, we therefore believe that whatever we can do to support biofortification, especially in view of the fact that our people are poor, they don't have the resources for pharmaceutical nutrients. They don't have the resources for dietary diversification. And therefore we believe that biofortification, breeding of the crops is the best approach. And when I came across Harvest Plus about two years ago, I've been doing the best I can to see that we support them. And you will also recall that in 2011, there was this Biosafety Act by the National Assembly that encourages, that sets a legal framework for research into biofortification in this country. It also regulates the importation and exportation of biofortified foods. And that has gone a long way to encourage some of the research institutes we have in the country, like the International, um, the, I mean, the Institute for Agricultural Research in Zaria, the National Root Crop Research Institute in Umodike, and the National Series Research Institute in Badegi. These research institutes have been doing the best that they can to see how some of our staple foods are biofortified. We are concerned at the National Assembly to see that the biofortified foods are available, they are affordable, and they are made available in all parts of this country. I'm therefore collaborating with uh, Harvest Plus. We are also trying to see the best we can to encourage these research institutes through better funding, encouraging them 
to take more of uh, some of these are staple foods and see how they could be fortified, like the rice, which I believe very soon, the National Series uh, Research Institute in Badigi will collaborate more with uh, Harvest Plus to see how uh, our rice could be fortified with zinc. I think that will go a long way to because rice is the most stable food in this country, if not the world over. I would also want to, uh, to say that it's very important that whatever government can do to encourage biofortification, because that is the way to go. Our people are poor, our people cannot afford the pharmaceutical, um, uh, I mean, supplements. Our people cannot afford a lot of fruits, vegetables, and what have you. And therefore, biofortification is the way to go. And I think the National Assembly and myself, we are collaborating with Harvest Plus to see how we can bring a bill up and also pass some motions to encourage biofortification in Nigeria. I thank you for this opportunity and uh, I look forward to more of this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, distinguished uh, Senator Bima, for your excellent support uh, and also for promoting the cause of biofortification uh, in the Nigerian Senate. Thank you so much for your excellent contribution. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Mr. Seth Osei Akoto. Uh, Mr. Seth Osei Akoto is the director of the Directorate of Crop Services in Ghana. Uh, five minutes, Mr. Seth Osei Akoto. You have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to also express my perspectives to the question, uh, lessons that we have learned in the process of producing locally adapted biofortified varieties. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, some threats to crop production uh, during the COVID pandemic arise from one, disruptions in the agriculture input supply chains, two, disruptions in marketing, linkages limiting the timely sale of produce and causing cash shortages in smallholder families for purchasing inputs and paid services. Three, limit access to extension services. And then lastly, external price volatility shocks. If all these, the consequences is that the rural population of Ghana are highly exposed to risks of food nutritional crisis. And then there's a possibility of food insecurity, nutrition deficiency, and hunger during the COVID-19 pandemic. And these calls for actions that could address the more nutrition issues. So through this, um, with the research institutions under the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana have support from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and our development partners to have released some varieties of bar 45 crop varieties for our rural population. So far, I have six pro vitamin A rich maize varieties that have been released for cultivation and utilization. Similarly, high iron and zinc rich beans are also being released to our populations that are living in the rural areas. Having done all these things, there are some lessons that have been learned. The first one is that um, the efforts at addressing malnutrition have been done through a set of concerted actions intended to ensure access to safe, healthy, and adequate food to feed its increasing population. Two, the Ghana government has also invested in the data gathering and reporting system to evaluate the effectiveness of all interventions 
that aim at improving agriculture, health, and nutrition. Furthermore, as the lessons learned, biofortified varieties of crops so require multi-sectorial collaboration in a well-structured and coordinated way while ensuring sustained funding for plant activities for the benefits to reach everyone. Then finally, I will say that the significant roles of non-governmental organizations cannot be underestimated. Their roles have been greatly impactful with respect to promotion of fortified foods. They have contributed through advocacy, sensitization, and awareness creations. And some of these non-governmental organizations include Calic, Adventist, and Presbyterian Relief Agencies. So ladies and gentlemen, I will end there and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Seth Osei Okot for your excellent presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Jonas uh, Chiano, who is the uh, TAT program manager uh, with the, uh, a program of the African Development Bank. Uh, five minutes, Dr. Jonas. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Tumilola. And um, I, um, I, want, I wish to thank the organizers for also inviting us to talk about the above fortification work under that. I'm going to extend a little bit uh, some of the introductory part that was made by our director, Dr. Martin Fregene. But I would like to start by first of all, letting people know what we are doing in that. That is a very important flagship program for the African Development Bank for its implementation of its strategy 2016 to 2025. And it is about improving productivity. Under that, we don't do any research. The reason is, before that, there was this popular saying that a lot of uh, research works have been done in Africa and that all the outcome, they are all on the shelf. So what we try to do in that is to get those things out of the shelf and try to use them to reach about 40 million farmers. So you can see that that is quite ambitious. And that is working on key commodities that include uh, the ones that have been mentioned by our director. And this is uh, the ones that uh, are being fortified uh, through breeding. That is beans, cassava, uh, maize, orange flesh, sweet potato. Uh, like everybody has said, uh, we have ongoing work uh, also with Harvest Plus of rice. But of course, we have also um, sorghum and millet. That is organized in, in, in compacts. And then we have, by those commodities, including, of course, um, aquaculture and small livestock, we have 15 compacts. And to be able to optionalize the work of those compacts, we also have enablers like policy services, water services, soil fertility services, capacity development, and technology outreach services. So to be able to make sure that the work in those commodities are well optimized. So um, that is currently being implemented in 27 regional member countries of the bank and deploying about 150 technologies, innovations, and cultural practices. And out of this co uh, co um, coverage, country coverage, about 59.5% of them are uh, fragile, in fragile situations. That has basically four fundamental principles. And I think it's important to mention that technology matters, scale matters, partnership matters, and collaboration, and then policy and regulation matter. If you don't have those principles, then you are not able to reach 40 million farmers. Now, the principle that is of, of great importance in what we are doing now is the fact that collaboration and partnership matters. And this includes the work, the partnership, the collaboration we are having with Harvest Cross. So let me give examples of the crops that, um, biofortified crops that uh, TAT is deploying. And like I mentioned before, we have a high iron bean and the high iron and zinc bean. Then we have um, cassava that is rich in beta carotenes. And then we have pro-vitamin pro A uh, maize. And then we have orange flesh with, and then we have high iron and zinc, sorghum and millet. Now, 
what is, I want to mention here, which probably is important, is that if you look at, for instance, the varieties being promoted under um, the millet and the sorghum compact, you find out that the parts per million for iron ranges from 65 to as high as 79 with a mean of about 70.25. And then parts per million for zinc is ranging from 30 to as high as 37 with a mean of 33.5 and so on and so forth. So for high iron bean, it is noted for its high content of both zinc and, and iron. Then I have mentioned that for maize, the parts per million ranges from six to 15 with a mean of about 8.5. Now we have numerous pro-vitamin A um, varieties of maize that are being deployed in many countries, including Nigeria, Ghana, Mali, Cameroon, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And then for cassava, we have this uh, pro-vitamin A cassava that is um, being deployed in many countries, including IBA 070593, IBA 082264, IBA 083594. But what I want to mention here is the most important is the lessons learned. The importance of partnership and collaboration. The bioportfolio crops that are being deployed under that, we are developed under other programs. For instance, the high iron bean was developed based on a program that is in East Africa called PABRA, which is Pan-African Bean Alliance. So, and then the biofortified cassava varieties that were deployed, they are developed based on joint activities of IITA and the SEAT. Then, the knowledge of the best instruments for the deployment of biofortified crops that we have been making use of in that include massive crop campaigns, community sensitization campaigns, government promotion in the use of some of those commodities, for instance, high iron bean in school feeding program as we have in the case of um, some countries, but mostly in Southern Africa, Tanzania. And more importantly, we have this instrument we call innovation platform, where we bring all the players along the value chain to be able to um, work together, to be able to develop the value chains of those different crops. Then the plan we have going forward is under that two and the subsequent phases. That has re clearly recognized the importance of nutrition smart agriculture and biofortification will be strengthened in the upcoming phases of that. So in conclusion, I would like to say that given the targets of TAT to reach 40 million farmers, small farmers, 40% of which are um, women by 2025, TAT can be a very good conduit for the dissemination of biofortified crops. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation on TAT and what you are doing at the African Development Bank. Excellent presentation. Now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ramajita Tabo uh, from the International Crops Research Institute for the semi arid Tropics. Uh, he is the Regional Director for West and Central Africa. Uh, Dr. Tabo, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pumilula. Uh, I was reading the chat and uh, I think somebody, I think it's Liz asking us to speak slowly so that the interpreters will not have problems. So I hope that is not going to eat on my time. So my speak, my presentation is going to add to what Jonas and others have said because we're working together on trying to scale up some of these uh, improved materials at the so-called uh, biofortified crops. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think uh, I would like to uh, make my presentation under four uh, stages. Uh, the first one is what our breeders have done in developing some of uh, the biofortified varieties. Uh, the second uh, stage is uh, how do we develop the seed system to ensure that farmers will have access to those improved materials. The third uh, is uh, the scaling up of these um, improved seeds as well as good agronomic practices to farmers. And the fourth one is the partnership that we developed with the private sector uh, to ensure that the product uh, are made available into different forms so that uh, people can consume them. Next slide, please. 
So under the first stage about uh, the materials and varieties that have been developed by our breeders, uh, my colleagues and uh, uh, especially Jonas have mentioned the high iron and uh, zinc content of uh, uh, varieties. And uh, here you can see two examples of two good uh, sorghum varieties that have been released in Nigeria. Uh, the first one has uh, more than 60% uh, increase in grain uh, iron. And the second one, some sort of 46 uh, on the bottom of the slide has more than uh, 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 about 62% in uh, zinc content. You can see that a specific material may not have both iron and uh, zinc content. I mean, they can have it too, but uh, sometimes I think the level of one of this element is higher in one variety uh, than the other. Next slide. Uh, here again, uh, we've shown uh, the per millet, and I think uh, one of the presenters talked about Shakti, which is a very early maturing variety of millet has been released in Niger in 2018. Uh, you can see on the right side, I think we had a field day and we we're visiting the farmer's field. And this uh, Shakti variety has over 65 milligram per kg of iron content, very good level. I mean, this is compared to local varieties that have only about 30 or 35 milligram. Uh, we have also varieties such as GB8735, ICTP8203 that have been selected for really fast tracking and for release in Niger, Ghana, and Senegal. Next slide. Uh, the second stage is, as, as I said, seed availability is a big constraint to adoption of any improved material. So we spend a lot of time working with our farmers using different techniques to try to promote those materials can see that also working with farmers in the field, using local radios, using mini packs of sorghum seed that can be distributed to farmers for the demonstration trials uh, plots in the field. And uh, we work also with seed companies to help them in the production of seed certified seed. Uh, we also use uh, outlet developed by farmer organization for seed set so that they can have field days where people can come and look at some of the materials and they can buy them or order them for future use. Capacity building is very important. So we, 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 we uh, uh, strengthen the capacity of uh, farmers and seed companies to produce seed so that uh, those materials can be available to farmers. This is a part of the scaling up that we're doing. Next one. Uh, the third stage is uh, how do we upscale and improve seed and, and good agronomic practices? Through demonstration plots. We use demonstration plot of uh, biofortified fields. You can see right there farmers gathering together and sometimes we use those lead farmers to guide their colleagues into those fields so that they can show them. Farmers buy in much easier when their own colleagues uh, uh, or friends uh, show them the, 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 the crops. And uh, innovation platform is another way to ensure sustainability of those improved varieties over a long period of time. Next slide. Uh, through, uh, we also boost the seed sector this is one of the examples of the sorghum millet compact and the tat that Jonas talked about. Uh, we go from breeder seeds from the uh, research station foundation seed from national institution and certified seed by the seed companies. And all along those lines, we try to help and strengthen the capacity to improve the seed uh, production. Next slide. Uh, this is to give you just an idea of uh, the level of iron and zinc and the different materials. You can see that some of these materials here have more than 60 uh, uh, part per million of uh, iron and more than 30 part per million of, uh, of zinc, while uh, whereas the local uh, varieties have less than 40 uh, or 35 percent of iron and 25 percent of zinc. So there are materials there that the good variability that uh, we have in those improved varieties that have been developed. Next slide. Now the fourth and last uh, item that I want to discuss with you is how do we promote those materials because product development is very important and there we work with private companies, with uh, uh, processing units, and particularly trying to train people like in Nigeria here, training some of these uh, ladies here on, on what we call the smart food campaign, which is a way of showing the importance of millet and sorghum in terms of nutritional value that they can get from, from uh, uh, those two crops. So uh, there's cooking uh, masters uh, sessions that are organized and TV realities, for example, here in uh, Kenya. Next slide. We promotion is uh, scaling up is uh, also having VIP, very important people like on the left side, you see the first lady of Niger, former first lady of Niger. She, uh, we had an edition of first meal where sorghum millet has been shown and she is an ambassador, uh, Ikrisat ambassador for uh, smart food. Uh, and that makes it really quite uh, 
uh, appealing to people. You can see on the right side also different types of processed food in Nigeria. And on the bottom part, I think we, and we also encourage uh, uh, ladies to cook the whole grains instead of really uh, milling it and things to cook those whole grains so that they can be contain their iron because when you boil it too much, you lose some of the contents. Next. Uh, so sorghum millet is good for you as a, for your nutrition, good for the planet because they have low carbon footprint and good for the farmer because it helps the farmer to generate food. And some of the studies you have done show that millet-based diet can lower risk of type 2 diabetes and help manage blood glucose level. The millets can reduce also uh, cardiovascular disease. So there's really a lot of good that you can get from some of these crops. Next slide. So uh, I think this is the one before last, and you can see that Ikrisat has one the 2021 April food price. So I cannot really stop with this uh, presentation, not mentioning that we'd like to thank all of you who have supported ICRISAT, who have been partners with. So I think this price is for all of us, for the smallholder farmer in uh, all the semi-arid tropics. And uh, we, we thank you for that. And uh, we are celebrating it. And 2023 has been also approved by the UN Assembly that is going to be International Year of Millet. That will bring in also a lot of publicity and funding for millet work. So, Mr. Chairman, I will stop here and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tabo, for your excellent presentation. And uh, congratulations once again to ICRISAT for thank winning you. the 2021 Africa Food Prize. Excellent thank you job. Very much. Excellent job. Congrats. Thank you very much. Very well. Now we move to another segment where we are going to have two speakers that will talk to us about food fortification as a complementary technology in combating micronutrient deficiency. The first of these two speakers is Dr. Richard Pendham, uh, who is the Regional Director for Africa for Nutrition International. Uh, Dr. Richard, um, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, Babatunde, for the generous uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers of this very important webinar uh, for improving, uh, for inviting, inviting Nutrition International to participate and make a presentation on food fortification in Africa. I've chosen to present on Africa because it also helped uh, West Africa to see how they, are, uh, they have performed in terms of food fortification in relation to the other regions. Next slide. The my presentation, I'll uh, briefly talk about, uh, talk about micronutrient deficiency in Africa, why food fortification, current coverage and compliance, challenges and opportunities, key considerations, and the Nutrition International support, and finally, a conclusion. Next slide, please. Micronutrient malnutrition is actually a major public health pro uh, problem in Africa but also in Asia, but West is still in Africa because of the much of our diet is actually a staple food, um, it's grains uh, that are uh, actually high in carbohydrate. And most of our countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa, if we, look at the, uh, if we look at the severity of micronutrient malnutrition, you would find out that in Sub-Saharan Africa, is a, actually a high, uh, alarmingly high, over 40% um, prevalence. And those are the ones that um, uh, are dark or maroon in color. And the rest is severe. Those are, that are moderate and mild is actually uh, in Northern, Northern Africa. So it's a, a major challenge for us um, in Africa. If, next slide, please. If we look at what have we done in terms of impact, uh, in terms of micronutrient malnutrition, we are actually seeing an increase in most of the countries. So those countries that are uh, maroon and brown are those countries that we have actually seen uh, an net increase in the level of micronutrient malnutrition. And those that are uh, green, dark green and light green are the ones that either they have, they're actually reducing uh, the micronutrient deficiencies. So most of our countries 
in uh, uh, in uh, south in western africa as well as um, uh, central africa and east africa we are still having problems we are we we are having more uh, num prevalent high prevalence of micronutrient uh, malnutrition uh, next slide just as uh, colleagues before me have talked up, uh, talked about strategies there is no one strategy that is actually recommended for reducing micronutrient malnutrition. There are six of them. Supplementation, which has been mentioned already, but dietary diversification has been mentioned. Uh, biofortification has been mentioned. But uh, in addition to those, we have also micronutrient powders, what we call um, fortification at the point of use and also disease control, because we know that that uh, infestation actually affect availability of micronutrients, even if they are available in the food, for them to be absorbed and be used by the, 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 the human body. Now, fortification is uh, one of the strategies, and uh, let me quote the Copenhagen consensus which was actually recommending on fortification. And it's, I, I quote, one of the most compelling investments is to get nutrients, nutrition, nutrients to the world's undernourished, end of quote. Now, when we look at fortification, next slide, please. Next slide. If we look at fortification, fortification is known as a low cost, high return investment. Every dollar invested in fortification is known to generate about $27 in return from averted disease, improved earnings, and enhanced work productivity. When it comes to iodized salt, we know that the incremental cost per person per year is only 5 cents, and the benefit cost ratio is 30 to 1. For wheat, maize fortification with iron and folate, incremental cost per person per year is 12 cents. And the benefit cost ratio of 46.1 for folate and 8.1 for iron. Next slide, please. Does large scale fortification works? Yes, it works. For those countries that have actually adopted large scale fortification and they have high coverage, population coverage of those uh, uh, staples that are fortified, it has actually shown to actually reduce um, uh, disease burden. For example, 34% reduction in anemia, 74% reduction in odds of goiter, uh, 41% for, decrease in odds of neural tube defect, more especially with the uh, 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 folate uh, fortification, and also reduction in vitamin A deficiency for 3 million children, significantly reducing risk of mortality. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of um, where we are in two a legislation because we know we cannot do fortification successfully unless we have actually uh, legis legislated food fortification. And uh, in legislation, it's actually ensuring that it's mandatory rather than being voluntary fortification because uh, evidence is there that voluntary uh, fortification does not actually yield greater results. Now, where are we in Africa? Um, just to, to highlight maybe a bit of a background, maize um, flour is one of the major vehicle targeted for food fortification. South Africa was the first country in Africa to introduce uh, maize fortification in 1972. And wheat flour, the first country was Zimbabwe, um, it, which introduced it in 1973. And the salt, the first country was Kenya in 1988. And the oil, the first country was Nigeria that introduced the uh, oil fortification in the year 2000 and made it mandatory in 2008. Now, this slide is actually looking at staples and where legislation is uh, from the countries that started in 1973, 72 or around 2000. 
we, what we see here is that 27 countries in Africa have mandatory legislation for at least one cereal grains or oil that I have actually uh, outlined those, uh, those grains. Second is of those majority have reached over 75% of the millers actually uh, they are able to actually uh, uh, fortify. However, 10 countries have less than 75% coverage of fortified food vehicle and can still benefit from better enforcement, accountability, and do, are doing more of coverage uh, studies to see how they are, they, they are improving. So 50th, but- Can uh, sum up? Uh, so that yes, uh, we can accommodate the last speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then we have the oil, oil fortification, which is a mandatory next slide, which we actually see that the countries in West Africa have done very well in terms of uh, mandatory fortification for oil. The next slide is IDD and sort iodization, iodization legislation. And I think uh, sort iodization we've done very well. A few countries that have not uh, done legislation. Uh, the next sli slide is looking at population coverage of fortified. Uh, there are only three countries that have coverage uh, figures for um, oil, and that is Tanzania, Uganda, and Senegal. The pattern remains with wheat. Only two out of 23 countries uh, which are Tanzania and Uganda have coverage figures which are quite low at 33 and 8.5. And maize is that only two countries, that is Tanzania and Uganda, uh, have actually coverage figures and the coverage figures are low at 2.5 for Tanzania and 6.5 for uh, Uganda. Next slide, please. If we look at uh, salt flow, we, you actually see that countries that produce salt are, are, the, are the ones that are lagging behind in terms of uh, adequate consumption of uh, uh, consumption at household level, consumption of adequately iodized salt. So there is a need to work with the countries that are producers because then they, they need to uh, actually speed up on issues of uh, compliance. Next slide. Uh, this is just looking at fortified versus forti fortified grains. Uh, what this slide shows is that maize flour, and this is study, these are figures from Africa and Asia. We see that wheat flour, only 32% is actually fortified. The rest is not. Maize flour, only 34. The rest, not. Rice is 1%, usually, mostly in Asia, but in Africa, and this is a big issue for West Africa, where most of the rice is actually eaten. Now, the last is the, the following slide is fortification and the quantity gaps for wheat, maize, oil, and salt. And the, this slide is actually showing uh, in general that there are a lot of staples and oils that are being consumed. But if we compare with what is actually um, uh, fortified, the figure goes down to 41 for wheat, uh, 37 uh, for, ma for maize. And if we look at what is adequately fortified, the figure goes down. So there is a gap at a global level, more especially this is data that was captured from 10 countries in uh, nine countries in Africa and uh, five countries in Asia. Now, what are the fortification challenges? Lack of political will and fortification legislation, inadequate fortification standards, limited coverage, compliance, and the impact assessment data is lacking or limited, poor regulatory enforcement, low capacity of medium and uh, small scale industry partners to comply with the standards and the challenges with the premix. For fortification opportunities, evidence is there. There's, we can actually, uh, evidence is there for need-based advocacy. We need to assess feasibility and scope of fortification from an optimal mix 
of interventions. I think it has been mentioned that it's only not one strategy. We need to have a complementary like food fortification and biofortification together. Harmonization of standards, very important. Establishing strengthened fortification data and monitoring systems Compliant context specific capacity building support to government is required. And uh, uh, we should also look at uh, innovation and research. Uh, in terms of, next slide, please. In terms of Nutrition International, the Nutrition International strive to support design and delivery of sustainable in country programs in eight, eight countries through open market and social protection, supporting enabling environment and working with meals and industry. In example, for in 2020, Nutrition, Nutrition International reached 250 million people with ad, adequately fortified staples. In conclusion, large scale fortification supports stronger resilient food systems that contribute to nutritious safe, affordable, sustainable dyes for everywhere. Programming priorities for large scale fortification would be five, consolidating progress and protect against, promoting situational analysis and data generation, supporting collaboration, facilitating capacities and strengthening monitoring and surveillance. Let me point stop at this and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richard, the Regional Director of Nutri uh, for Africa, Nutrition International. Thank you for your excellent presentation and for the work that Nutrition International is doing on the continent. Uh, now, our next speaker is Dr. Ahmed Kablan from USAID, uh, who will make a presentation on USAID large scale food fortification initiative. Uh, five minutes, Dr. Ahmed. Please uh, stick to time as much as possible. Uh, you have the floor, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank organizer uh, for, for inviting me to speak about USAID effort to address micronutrient my, malnutrition. As we all know, malnutrition is a complex problem to solve. It is, does not mean that we cannot tackle it. Globally, 1.9 billion adults and are overweight or obese, while 462 million are underweight. More than that, on the top of that, 2 billion people across the world suffer at least from one major deficiency in vitamin or mineral. For example, anemia affects about 800 million women and children caused by iron deficiency. Among children, 52 million under fives are suffering from wasting where they have a low weight for height. And one in 10 children are born with low birth weight. Finally, about 260,000 children are born with preventable neural tube defects. This is happening at the same time when we are losing and or wasting about one third of the global food produced globally. 45% fruits and vegetables that as we know are packed with micronutrient and, and minerals are lost, which translate into tons of micronutrient lost or wasted annually before making it to the consumer. In Sub-Saharan Africa alone, there is some 4 billion in post-harvest food losses each year which an amount could feed up to 48 million people. These numbers are unjust. An efficient, sustainable food system should be able to deliver all essential nutrients, macro and micronutrients to consumers. Equitable access to safe, nutritious, affordable diet is a human right. That's why USAID adopted recently under the Feed the Future, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, the food system, the RFIS food system framework was projected in the first slide here. Next, please. As we can see here, these are different approaches that we can use to support women and children and everyone to address micronutrient deficiency and malnutrition overall, whether it is optimal breastfeeding, which is the first ideal food system for children up to six months of age, supplementation, diet diversification, biofortification, and large scale fortification. As Dr. Richard all of mentioned, before me, all of these are approaches that work together to address micronutrient deficiency. Not one approach is enough to address all of them. I want to emphasize that biofortification and conventional fortification or large scale fortification are very different approaches operationally and how they can be conducted and what they can deliver. They are complementary, but they cannot, they are not substitute for one another. 
Large scale fortification is one of the key ways we can work through food system to improve diet and nutrition. Large scale fortification entail improving the nutritional quality of food items during the processing stage. And it is a cost effective and sustainable public health intervention to provide vulnerable population with at least minimal, minimum of essential micronutrient that may be inadequate in their diets. That's why we are at USAID consider a resilient and sustainable food system that include processed food that meet the quality and safety standard, including large scale fortification standard for stable crops and condiments. This does not mean that we fortification will increase the consumption of certain stable condiment. It is more of delivering on micronutrients through this vehicle. Next slide, please. This slide would just explain some of the unique feature of larger scale fortification. As uh, my colleague speaker, Dr. Richard mentioned earlier, proven larger scale fortification is a proven potential to improve diet and nutritional outcomes of the vast population, inclusive of low, middle, and high income communities at a very low cost. Once set up and are running, and that is the initial major cost, the vast majority of costs covered by industries and consumers. Large scale fortification provide a safety net against micronutrient deficiency that often occur seasonally or during times of crisis when food supply is low and or not diverse. The large scale fortification provide an easy way to uptake of micronutrient among population target populations. Since large scale fortification does not require consumer behavior change, does not need adoption of few seed varieties or any changes in the color or the taste of the food provided. With large scale fortification tend to incre trend increase processing of food by industry as we are experiencing right now, large scale fortification has the potential to become more impactful over time. Next slide. To enact on our commitment, we have developed a comprehensive large scale fortification result framework and we are working on programming to guide the assistant and to assist USAID mission in determining how they can most strategically invest and support large scale fortification, recognizing that USAID will not take on the entirety of, an, of the result framework and the need to coordinate and complement other stakeholders across governments, the private sector, and civil society and academia. Additionally, we have committed funds to develop dietary, food industry, and enabling environment policy assessment methodologies that can assist mission to decide what we may be most strategic to address large scale fortification within the result framework. Finally, we are developing a new central mechanism that can support missions in their large scale fortification directly through missions bilateral mechanism. The uh, request for information have been closed in September 3rd and the process is moving forward. Uh, thank you for, so much for uh, the time and uh, happy to take any question if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed Kablan, uh, especially in terms of what USAID is doing. Uh, now we move to the segment on question and answer. Uh, but before um, we do that, um, we are going to ask our two speakers to basically set the tone for us. Uh, three minutes each for uh, each of them. And then uh, Ms. S.C. Amuafu will basically Take us, in, take us through the question and answer session. Now, uh, the first speaker uh, in this segment is uh, uh, Paulina Adi, who is the Director, Women in Agricultural Development Directorate. Uh, three minutes just to set the tone for question and answer. Paulina, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, for the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, we have really worked hard with the researchers in the area of biofortification, but with the need to also respond quickly to the malnutrition issues and also to address the needs of hidden hunger. We also have collaborations with large scale operators in the area of fortification and also other sectors such as the health ministry and also trade. Yes, a lot has been said about uh, fortification, large scale, yes, but then there are investment issues that need to be considered because, because if it has to be large scale, then you'd have to make sure you have the needed infrastructure 
and also the ability to bring in the fortificants to ensure absolute uh, fortification. Most of the produce or products have been mentioned. In Ghana, there's mandatory fortification of our flowers, also for cooking oil and iodine, and also industries have sprung up and they are also on the fortification agenda. Top on the list is one huge um, industry that does the corn soy blend fortified with as many as 18 minerals and vitamins to support nutrition for children, lactating mothers, and also pregnant women. And all this to address the issue of the hidden hunger, which we don't see, but have very ravaging effects on the body. And uh, premium foods has been supported by the Canadian government and also WFP to establish a huge factory that produces 96,000 tons of grits and the uh, corn soy blend. And the beauty of it is that it transcends our borders because WFP will lift it out of Ghana to places where these produce or products are needed to meet dietary requirements. There's also the Yedet Industries that has also breakfast uh, foods and also fortified to meet similar needs. And uh, beyond this, there are so many emerging industries that also do fortification. But there are the hazards, and this we have to be mindful of. You don't just fortify. You have to work within permissible limits. And that is ensured by the Food and Drugs Authority in Ghana that uh, makes sure our food does not endanger our very lives. So briefly for fortification, it is capital intensive, unlike biofortification, but it comes in handy to solve problems quickly for us to remain healthy. So I would want to end here and then open up for questions that may come up. Thank you very much. I hope I have been in time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Paulina, thank you so much. Yeah, you stick to time. Uh, thanks for exploring how to scale up our fortified crops and fortification in West Africa. Now, it's my pleasure to invite uh, S.C. Amuafu from the Harvest Plus, who is the Harvest Plus board member, to basically set the tone and then moderate the question and answer session. Uh, S.C., the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Baba today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you find yourself. And uh, we are indeed grateful that you joined and stayed on up to this time. As has been indicated, I'll make a very brief comments and set the tone for the discussion segment. You would agree with me that our expert presenters and panelists have shared diverse information on biofortification and fortification with specific example from our sub region. As has been indicated, Biofortification initiatives and actions in the region in particular has been extensive as a result of several years of breeding, producing high yielding varieties that is available and contributing to um, addressing micronutrient malnutrition among over 3 million consumers in this region. I think a lot has been said about the types of crop in the region and the burden of micronutrient deficiency. And um, I'm not going to go into that to save time, but to say that um, there are dire consequences if this burden of malnutrition continues. But the good news is that the scientific evidence has proven the nutritional impact of biofortification and fortification. And today, there are so many varieties that are at various stages of development and ready to be released or are already available to farmers and um, households. However, with all this, we also do know that progress has been slow 
erratic and difficult. Now, the question I would want questions and our great panelists to ponder over, the overarching question is how does the region build on this progress that has been made on bar fortification in particular to address malnutrition in the sub-region? And for this, I will just share a few points and open it up for discussion. The stage is set and the global environment. And in more recent times, the Food um, Security Summit and the Food Nutrition for Growth Summit, I beg your pardon, that is coming is also setting the agenda for us. And never before has it been more relevant to build micronutrient security into our food system. Biofortification is critical for this agenda. And for us to make progress, it must be positioned within the broader food system context. We need to consider how we will address scaling up challenges with sustainable consideration. And we should think about industrial fortification and biofortification as complementary. If we are going to make progress, we need to be heavily present on the ground in the various countries in the sub-region. We need to be on the ground and build systems so we can engage policies and strengthen advocacy for investment. This we should focus on value chain partnership, strengthening capacities, fostering enabling environment, and not forgetting the critical role of gender equitable consideration in all this. And they need to focus on every stage on the food value systems, and thus building a very holistic approach. Finally, I cannot end by bringing our minds to the fact that we need to include resilience consideration, particularly in the face of the evolving COVID pandemic, focusing particularly on nutrition sensitive, sensitivity and sustainability of food systems as our key outcome. And remembering that whilst we are to rebuilding food systems that have been destroyed by the COVID um, pandemic, there is the silver lining that it presents us great opportunities to not only restore, but fundamentally broaden the agenda and transform our food systems. Finally, let us remember as Howdy pointed, the agenda is nutrition, livelihood, and touching development. I thank you. I'll now open it up and I'll start with a few questions, cross-cutting questions for our panelists. And we'll take more questions as we go. Thank you very much. So I would start with a question for um, Howdy. Hello, Howdy. I believe you are still online. Hello, Howdy. I'm here. I'm here. Great. The question is, as we move forward with this scale-up agenda, there is the push to mainstream breeding of higher nutrients in new staple crops variety. What progress in your estimation is being done in this respect? Over to you, Howdy. Well, the big um, the big push now is uh, is to get adoption of the crops. We've been we've been breeding the crops for 15 years. Uh, we have high yielding varieties that are nutrient dense. Um, we've done the nutrition studies, and now it's it's primarily a matter of of scaling up. And so, um, you know, we've had we've had success in several countries. Uh, we we have a lot of knowledge now about how to do it, and um, it's really, um, to some extent, it's a it's a funding constraint. You need some money to jumpstart the process in each country. Uh, I live in the Philippines. Uh, biofortification hasn't really taken off in the Philippines because so far there hasn't been uh, any, any investment. Uh, you, need, you need a few million dollars to
to do some of the initial activities that are required to jumpstart the process. If you're a private company and you have a new product, uh, you have to invest some money in advertising, getting it out to consumers. It's the same, it's the same thing with uh, new varieties of crops. So that's, uh, I think that's kind of where we are. We wanna reach hundreds of millions of people and uh, we, have to, uh, we have to do those activities and pay for those activities that it takes to get those varieties out to farmers. Thank you very much, Howdy. The point has been made. We need funding, we need advocacy. We need country presence. I'll now move on to Martin if you are there. Martin, the question is, why does the African Development Bank see as um, in particular the challenge for countries wanting to scale up biofortification? And how do you see your bank um, helping in this direction? Martin, if you are there, you can quickly touch on this. So can address more questions. Martin? Okay, we are not hearing from Martin. Um, can Jonas, can Jonas intervene, please? Yeah, sure, please. If you can do that quickly, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Let me just um, address this question from the point of view of what we have seen under the auspices of uh, the Technologies After Culture Transformation. You know, um, our ambition has been to reach 40, small, 40 million smallholder farmers, um, starting from 2018 uh, until 2025. We have been able to, like Martin mentioned, reach uh, about 10 million plus. However, the, the, the gap is still there and we're not too far away from um, 2025. Um, this is 2021. So the onus now would be to meet up the remaining 30 million uh, in, in four years. The lessons we have learned so far is that um, you need a lot of partners to do this. And this explains why going forward for the upcoming phases of that, we are trying to work with the African Union Commission the regional economic communities and their specialized institutions, because uh, we need a lot more hands to be able to get this done. And they are tacitly part of the ongoing uh, development of second phase of that. So, but um, adoption, like um, Dr. Howard has said, is an issue, even though there has been some improvement over the years, but again, there is need to have some investment to stimulate some of these things and do a lot of demonstration for people to see. And this explains why on that part, we have two planks. Plank number one is where we are doing a lot of demonstrations to show the power of science, technology, innovations, and good agricultural practices. And once that has been done, we have now been able to see countries who are now borrowing to deepen the benefits of that. So, I think it's working, but it takes time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now there's a question that is very interesting. As I indicated in my opening remarks, next week, the UN Food System Summit is coming up, followed by the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Now, I see that as an opportunity to write a blank check. Why um, should the global leaders take steps to advance support to scale up biofortification in Africa and indeed globally. Um, I'll take two quick um, remarks from any of our panelists. What should be our ask from these summits? You see, do you want to have a go at this? Is it from Nigeria? This is Tabo, can I say something? Tabo, sure, please. Go ahead. Okay, um, so uh, you are asking why the uh, Food Summit should uh, 
take forward the um, request for funding or uh, for investment building. into bar fortification. Yeah, for investment. Of course, I, I think if you can, uh, you know, look back into the presentations, uh, malnutrition is a big problem. It's a big problem in the whole of Africa, uh, not only for the children who are stunted or anemic uh, people and uh, women, pregnant women, but it's, it's not really the quantity of food that is uh, important, but also the nutritive value of the group. So biofortification is addressing all these problems. And in my presentation, I said that not only it reduces diabetes, but also which is becoming a big problem in Africa, but also cardiovascular disease and all other diseases. So if uh, the global leaders uh, would like to have a healthy population uh, that can take uh, forward uh, the agricultural activities and make agriculture really this uh, foundation of economy, then we should fund, uh, they should fund uh, this uh, initiative and uh, make scaling of biofortified bio crops uh, to a larger community so that we can reach as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Essie, hey, can I make a few remarks? You this have the floor, Howdy. Howdy. Howdy, please go ahead. Yeah. I think, well, <clears throat> we've all made the point that you need, uh, you need a number of different types of interventions. Um, but the, I think the underlying cause, the underlying cause is poor quality diets. Everybody says it's the underlying cause. But um, previous to biofortification, um, you know, that's the underlying cause, but let's not treat the underlying cause. Let's, let's have things outside of dietary quality. So what, what biofortification does, it, it, it addresses the underlying cause of why we have so much micronutrient malnutrition. And so you're really, you're really doing something to solve the problem at a very low cost. Um, I, my, my best example, the first biofortified crops is carrots. Car I'm sorry to use an example from the United States, but carrots provide 30% of the pro vitamin A intake in the United States. Carrots used to be white, carrots used to be purple. Carrots used to have zero vitamin A. And, and over time and through agriculture research, uh, now they have so much vitamin A that it, it permanently provides 30% of the vitamin A intake in the United States. So that's what, that's what the promise of biofortification is in uh, low and middle income countries is um, it's just like a, a, a permanent source of these minerals and vitamins. Um, and you've done something long-term to solve, help solve the problem. And you're not, you're not coming in with um, recurrent recurrent uh, initiatives to fill in the gaps that are caused by poor dietary quality. In the Philippines, they have vitamin A, they've had a vitamin A supplementation program for 28 years. Mothers who got a vitamin A supplement as a preschool child are now their mothers and they're bringing their own children to get vitamin A supplements. And there's no, there's no guidance for when the vitamin A supplementation program should be uh, stopped. When, when, do, when do diets in the Philippines reach a level where vitamin A supplementation is no longer required? Um, it's, a, it's a great program, but how long are we going to keep filling in the gaps and not, not uh, addressing the underlying problem? Uh, so that's, to me, that's what the promise of biofortification is. We need, we need to continue supplementation. We need to continue commercial fortification. But at the same time, we have to address the underlying problem. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, I think the case has been made. There's a disease burden and fortification works and it's sustainable. And actually, um, how do in answering this, you have also answered a question that has been posed on um, Large scale fortification and biofortification, which is cheaper and sustainable, and how? And I think you just made that point. Honorable Senator Bina, um, there's a comment. Um, if you are on, we'll be grateful if you can react. The point is that 
the effort in promoting biofortification of maize, cassava, and rice for food for high class had been at the expense of low income population. There's the need to consciously design and support the promotion of biofortified crops for um, the low income group. Um, Senator Honorable, would you give us a quick response as we attempt to bring this to a close? Thank you very much for that beautiful question. As I said in my presentation, we are collaborating with Harvest Plus to see how we can encourage and enhance biofortification in Nigeria. Not only in the case of maize and millet, but also rice and uh, maybe some other crops that they may come up with. We are doing the best we can. I know that there is need for improvement. We are, we are liaising with Harvest Plus and uh, encouraging research institutions to go into biofortification. Bio we will also uh, do the best we can to encourage government for sensitization. Because one of the problems that our people have is ignorance. They think just eating food and getting filled up with food is enough. But that is, that is, not, that is not the case. We need to eat healthy food. And the National Assembly is here to do its best to collaborate with all relevant stakeholders to see what we can do to encourage biofortification, which the last speaker said is in the, is, it is highly sustainable and that is the best way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now back to my panelists again. Um, there is a question on the role of market in scaling up bar fortification. Who wants to take this? In the next one minute. Okay, as I wait for others to come, I think that experience from countries have indicated that because there are so issues around socioeconomic um, concerns among consumers and particularly around the amount set some um, assuming all bar fortified crops are GMO, it is important that we improve information sharing and we need to have a way of communicating benefits and markets plays a very important role in this to um, trigger product acceptance and preference and the development of um, brands for biofortified seeds and food crops is also very important and is dependent on markets and also the whole process of trial adoption for biofortified crop is also very important and it depends on markets. And I'm still waiting for other members of the panel to add to this. Do I see any hand up? Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. let me talk about markets. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, for us in Nigeria, markets play an important role um, in the uh, biofortified crops value chains. Now, because most of the grains uh, that are produced um, are being sourced from the markets, be it the open market or the aggregation centers. So of recent, uh, what we try to do is to bring in the market actors also to integrate them into the value chains. We of recent had a meeting with the commodity brokers from uh, most of the major grain markets in Nigeria, uh, where they're able to identify um, uh, uh, the vitamin A maize, they also uh, been able to provide vitamin A maize information to uh, 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 processors because whenever processors come to the market to bulk, they say they okay we need vitamin A maize, and before now they tell them okay we don't have such information, but now we've equipped them with every information they need to know, and they also need to provide to uh, processors once they come to the markets to buy. And again, of recent, we've also um, um, noticed that there's a cross-border activity going on along the vitamin A maize value chain, 
which has not been tracked um, from one of the largest grain markets in Nigeria, the Wano market in Kano. There are truckloads of uh, vitamin A maize that moves from that market into Niger Republic, into Central Africa Republic, and all into Ghana. But um, these volumes of grains have not been tracked. Now, um, from the seed companies, we also uh, get to know that yeah, this season, some uh, volumes of seeds have moved from premier seeds into uh, Ghana, but this has also not been tracked. So moving forward, we're going to um, be collecting data on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. What should the role of the World Health Organization be in scaling up and making biofortified crops available to household in the subreg? The role of the World Health Organization. Who wants to take that? Well, Jesse, I, I apologize. I think I'm speaking too much. No, you don't. But um, apologize, please go ahead. So what? Uh, what? Can there's a pro the there's a process ongoing now where the WHO, in collaboration with the FAO, they're reviewing the nutrition literature. There's a there's a technical term that I can't remember the exact name of the process, but uh, a group of experts reviews the literature, nutrition literature on biofortification. And then based on the nutrition literature, they, um, they pronounce a level of, there are different levels of endorsement of different types of nutrition interventions. And so this process has been going on for several years now. And so we're, um, we're waiting for that process to be completed and for the WHO in collaboration with the FAO to pronounce what their level of, um, their level of endorsement of biofortification is. Great. Um, how do you, I think you are a better place to answer this question actually. Um, how could we support the pro process of triggering biofortification techniques and practices to other countries with low um, capacity or knowledge on integrating biofortification into their food production system. Obviously, countries are at various stages. And with your experience, how should this be done across the sub-region? Well, I think I think maybe Dr. Tabo could uh, answer answer also. Um, the CGIR centers such as ICRASAD and IITA, they have very good um, collaborations with the uh, with many different countries and they they develop the initial biofortified varieties the the best germplasm and so in collaboration with the CGI or centers they can make the biofortified varieties available to all the different countries that they have collaborations with yeah I can Dr. Tebow, uh, what do you want to add to that yes uh, yes uh, thanks uh, Dr. Buiz, uh, in fact, ICRISAT is undertaking a lot of capacity building uh, of uh, scientists and technicians uh, in the region, uh, in all in Western South Africa and also at the headquarters in Patanchero. Uh, we are developing now what we call the Regional Crop Improvement Hub here at Bamako at the ICRISAT Center. And this center of excellence for crop improvement using modern techniques is going to be used to train new scientists that are going to be coming out from the national programs uh, to learn the new tools of uh, breeding, accelerating uh, crop improvement. You know, it takes about 10 years or so to develop a variety, but with the new tools of biotechnology and molecular markers, you can uh, uh, reduce that to about five to six years. So we're training them. And I think biofortification is really uh, one of the Thing, the approach that we're going to use to improve nutrition in the region. So yes, capacity building is one thing and uh, we're going to continue to work with the NARS program in the region to get the capacities up so that they can incorporate that into their own national programs. Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for 
great presentations and submissions and uh, say that the conversation is going to continue. Um, we haven't exhausted all the questions and um, we are going to have a Mentimeter question and then um, we'll close. So I would want to hand you over to uh, Baba today and thank you for collaborating with me and for your presence. Thank you very much. Uh, Baba Tude, over to you. Thank you so much, Essie, for excellent moderation of the Q&A session. And thanks to our panelists for their responses. Now we move to the Mentimeter poll question to see to what extent our participants have understood the conversation today. Uh, let me now turn it over to Saga to take us through this particular question. Saga, over to you. Hello, thank you, Babo Tende. So our final question with the link that you guys can click to answer is what makes biofortification a reliable technology to address micronutrient malnutrition? So this should be um, a question that kind of sums up everything that we've heard today from our great speakers. Um, so please, uh, let me just share with you the screen to see the results. We can have a few more uh, responses. Well, to quickly close up, um, we have most of our responses as correct. All of these options, the technology is centered around enriching staple crops. It is a technology that requires minimal investment after initial introduction. And with the right policies enabling environments, all countries can adopt and adapt the technology. So thank you, everyone. It seems like we had a great audience who were knowledgeable about biofortification and food fortification. Um, I'll pass it off to Babatunde now to do his closing um, and to give us some key takeaways from today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Saga. And um, I want to first and foremost uh, thank all participants. I want to thank our panelists uh, for all their contributions today and their interventions. In particular, we uh, were delighted to hear from um, Dr. Howdy, a World Food Prize laureate, as well as a pioneer uh, in the field of our fortification. Uh, we're also delighted to hear from Dr. Martin Fregene, who is also another pioneer. Uh, on biofortification from the African Development Bank, uh, the Director for Agriculture and Agro Industry Department. Also, uh, several other speakers, uh, including Ikrisat, Dr. Tabo, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, but more importantly, uh, congratulations once again to Ikrisat for winning the uh, 2021 Africa Food Prize. Uh, also, uh, many thanks to Dr. Richard from Nutrition International, the Regional Director for Africa. Uh, also, Dr. Ahmed from, uh, uh, from uh, USAID. And many of our speakers from Ghana and from all over the world, thank you uh, for all your contributions. Uh, in terms of key takeaways, I think uh, I want to leave you with uh, three main key takeaways. Uh, the first of them is that even when FAO itself was created, uh, the main, the number one goal uh, was for FAO to help increase nutrition levels around the world. Uh, so which means nutrition is extremely important for all of us and how we address malnutrition is very key. Uh, not only in terms of achieving uh, the sustainable development goals, but also in terms of feeding uh, Africa. Uh, so that is a big takeaway for all of us. Uh, the second takeaway is that biofortification remains a reliable technology to address malnutrient, uh, micronutrient malnutrition around the world, especially in Africa. And the technology is actually centered around enriching staple crops. And we know what the technology is and we know how to deploy them. And that means we have to have the right policies, the right enabling environment to be able to support African countries to adapt and adopt this particular technology. I think also for me and for many of us, uh, the top takeaway is that we need more investment in this space. Uh, we need to embrace partnership. We need to do advocacy to be able to scale up uh, our, our investments in this area. And so uh, all of these are extremely important. And for us at the African Development Bank, we're already pioneering uh, this kind of work through our TAT uh, initiative, which was presented today, but also through our banking and nutrition partnership 
through which we have been able to scale up around $2.3 billion in uh, nutrition smart investments across the continent, but also through the African Leaders for Nutrition Initiative, which the bank is pioneering, working with other partners, including the African Union and the regional economic communities, to basically amplify the voices of African leaders, African ministers, to put more resources behind uh, end the malnutrition on the continent. But more importantly, in terms of ensuring that we uh, work towards achieving the sustainable development goals using nutrition as a lens to do that on the continent. Once again, let me thank all of you for your contributions, for your interventions. And I also want to thank all uh, my fellow co-organizers of this webinar for excellent well, uh, job well done. Especially, I want to single out Saigal and Adama for bringing all of, all of us together. Again, thank you from me, Babatunde Omilola, signing off from the African Development Bank. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay, thank you and bye bye, everybody. Any thanks, Babatunde? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you.